Are you ready, Dr. Steinberg? Because we can get going. Okay, sounds good. Perfect. Right on. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us from wherever you may be today. Uh, so welcome to the Global Primatology Virtual Conference hosted by Central Washington University. My name is Carson Black, and I will be moderating this session today. This session is with Dr. Eliana Steinberg and will last until 1030. Before we start, I wanted to let you all know that this session will be recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, then you may turn your camera off. Additionally, to make this a fun learning experience for everyone involved, I'm going to request that we all follow a few session rules. One mic, one voice, only one person speaks at a time. Respect all identities. This includes pronouns, nationalities, ethnic groups. This is also a safe space, so please don't feel discouraged. All are welcomed to engage and ask questions. One question only out of respect for others and time, please to just um, please stick to just asking one question at a time. Only speak for yourself and no one else. No name calling or derogatory comments or questions of any kind. Failure to comply with this will result in your termination from the session. And last but not least, please keep the chat clear of traffic and only use it to propose questions. Um, and now that we're all on the same page, it is time to introduce Dr. Eliana Ruth Steinberg. Uh, her pronouns are she, her, hers, and she's an Argentinian primatologist. She works at the Evolutionary Biology Research Group at Buenos Aires University and is a researcher at CONACET. Her current work focuses on evolutionary genetics and systematics in platyrrhini. She uses cytomolecular tools on both somatic and germ cells to study chromosomal evolution in New World monkeys, as well as to understand the chromosomal changes that occurred in the Y chromosome along the divergence between new and old world monkeys. And with that, Dr. Steinberg, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the organization of the Global Primatological Conference for allowing us to present our work in this conference. Well, let's start sharing the screen. There we go. Let's see. Oops. Here we go. Well, my name is Eliana Ruth Steinberg. I work at the Grupo de Investigación en Biología Evolutiva, Evolutionary Biology Research Group in English at Buenos Aires University. Hi, here we go. The head of the lab is Professor Marta Dolores Moody. There are several research lines being conducted in the lab, such as uh, Dr. Nancy Andreoli for studies in toxicity of chemical for agronomic application, or Dr. Annalisa Tropea and Gabriela Russo, who study evolutionary patterns and processes in human population of America. But I'm here to show you what we do, what we study in non-human primates. Uh, I work in evolutionary genetics and systematic in Tatuini, and uh, together with the professor Marta Mudri and the undergraduate student Lila Maladesti, who is patiently waiting until the uh, restrictions due to COVID-19 are lifted so she can start her undergraduate thesis studying the chromosomal distribution of ribosomal DNA in neotropical primates. So hopefully in the next conference, she can show you her results. So, what do we do? We study primate evolution through this analysis of the chromosome, of how the chromosomes change between the different species. One can follow this chromosomal information and use it as a phylogenetic marker. But how do we study primate chromosomes? We work mostly uh, with peripheral blood samples taken under anesthesia by veterinarians. We perform uh, lymphocyte cellular cultures using a reagent called fetomaglutinin, who allow us to the differentiate the lymphocytes into lymphoblasts, so they start dividing. When we obtain the desired metaphase to study the chromosome, we apply differential staining techniques, such as G-banding technique. As, 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 uh, an example is here, this is the ideogram of Zeus Apella, where you can see the pattern of longitudinal dark and light bands that is specific for each chromosome. 
Therefore, we can compare the problems of different species and see the rearrangements that have occurred among them. An example of this, of the importance of the cardiological diagnosis, is the square monkey cymeding, the genus cymeding, cymeding is pink. All square monkeys have 44 chromosomes, but their cryotypes differ by percentage inversion. So these inversions involve a portion of the chromosome that has the centromet. These portions invert, and therefore the chromosome morphology changes. In this example, changes from a submetacentric chromosome to an acrocentric one, or vice versa. This way, we can distinguish among the different karyotypes of the different species, and this is very important, especially when you have a specimen in captivity. Here's an example. For Saimiri boliviensis, there are two subspecies described, Saimiri boliviensis boliviensis and Saimiri boliviensis peruviensis. These two species differ in these two chromosome pair. This species, Saimiri boliviensis peruviensis, possesses the B10 pair, who is submetacentric, and Saimiri boliviensis peruviensis has the C2 pair, who is acrocentric. A hybrid between these two subspecies will have fertility problems because an heterozygote for this type of inversion has problems in, their in, in, in its meiosis. Therefore, it is very important to perform the cardiological diagnosis in order to obtain a correct species diagnosis. Because uh, when the identification for the uh, with the Pelage coloration pattern is often difficult for the unexperienced eyes, so the cytogenetic can help you decide which species belong to the specimen. Now, the cytomological, te cytomological techniques allow us to dig even deeper. With the technique of fluorescence in situ hybridization, we can label with the fluorescent la label with a fluorochrome a region or an entire chromosome and hybridizes on the chromosome of another species. If they have similarity, if they have a sequence similarity, then they will hybridize. We have the chromosome probes for all human chromosomes. Therefore, you can follow the uh, evolution of the chromosomes in the different neotropical primate species using these chromosomes. You can know in each neotropical primate where the, a certain human chromosome hybridized. Here we can see an example on the brown howler monkey, Aluata guariva clamica. This is a metaphyse hybridized with the probe for human, human chromosome 15 in green and human chromosome 3 in red. And we can see all the places where the brown howler monkey genome has homeology or sequence similarity with these human chromosomes. And here, let's see, let's put it this way. Uh, and here we can see a G banded metaphase. And to the right, you can see the homeology of each black and gold holder monkey with each human chromosome. This way, we can follow the evolution, the chromosomal evolution, across the different species primates. But we, when we study all the human chromosomes on the neotropical primates, we got a surprise. When we study the hybridization of the human Y chromosomes in all Catarine primates, Hominodea, no problem, we got a, a very free hybridization signal. But when we try to do it on the neotropical primate, no hybridization signal. Here we see a metaphase of a telespaniscus, and we can see the clear sign of the X chromosome, who is uh, highly conserved among all mammals, but no sign for the Y chromosome. And this was a constant for everyone who tried to do it, no signal of the Y chromosome, of the human Y chromosome probe, 
in neotropical fragments. Furthermore, when we try to use the probe for the SRY gene, you know, the sex determination gene, in both uh, primates, in both platyrrhine and uh, a contour in Homo sapiens, we find no stabilization signal. Here we see the SRI signal on a human metaphase and the stabilization signal of human chromosome 21, but no red signal for SRY in platyrrhine. But we know the SRY gene is present in this species. It has been amplified by PCR. So what happened? Well, for a probe to be visible in an, micro, in an optic microscope, it needs to be at least 120 kilobytes. So the SRI probe has more genes other than the SRY. One hypothesis is that platyrrhine Y chromosome, compared with human and other platyrrhine Y chromosomes, is highly reorganized. That's why we cannot get a signal with the whole uh, human Y chromosome probe or with small uh, sections such as the SRY gene. But that's not the only interesting characteristic of the Y chromosome in platyrrhine. You know, as sex chromosome systems in platyrrhine and platyrrhine, the more frequently observed one is the XY in male, XX in females. But we now know that the Y chromosome in platyrrhine is different. But the Y chromosome in platyrrhine has another interesting characteristic. It's involved in many neotropical prey species in multiple sex chromosome systems. What is that? A multiple sex chromosome system is a sexual sex chromosome system that arises by Y autosome translocation. I mean, there is an exchange of genetic material between the ancestral Y chromosome and an autosomal pair. Therefore, in the new sex chromosome system in males, you have the ancestral, y, uh, the ancestral X chromosome, that now is called X1, the chromosome that possesses both portions of the ancestral Y and the autosome called I1, I2, and the chromosome uh, that is not involved in the rearrangement now is called X2. Here we see a genetic metaphase of the black and gold hole monkey, Alwata Karasha, and here we see the female has a two X chromosomes, and in this case, this autosome, chromosome number seven, is the one involved in the rearrangement. In the males, we leave this uh, portion of the karyotype in blank because these two chromosomes are involved in the sex uh, chromosome system, and the males have a sex chromosome system, X1, X2, Y1, Y2. This uh, type of sex chromosome system are extremely rare, rare in catarrhine. It has been described only in one species, the silver cliff monkey. But in platyrrhine, this type of system has been described in many other species, in howler monkeys, in owl monkeys, in tamarinds, and in cacachao. Howler are a remarkable model to study this type of sex chromosome system. Why? Because in several species in, of this, uh, in this genus, this type of system has been described. You have six chromosome system for by three chromosomes, by four chromosomes in the male, and even five chromosomes in the male, depending on the number of autosomes involved in the Y autosome translocation. In a collaboration that we made with uh, Dr. Canales Espinosa from the Universidad Veracruzana de, de, of Mexico and Dr. Uh, Liliana Cortez Ortiz from the University of Michigan in the United States, we got to study the Mesoamerican species 
of the uh, of these genomes, Albata pigra and Albata pareata. And when we analyze and uh, when we analyze the sex chromosomes, we notice that when in South America the chromosome, the autosome involved in the rearrangement with the white chromosome has homology to human chromosome 15 and 3. 15 and 3 in all the species that were studied by this methodology. But when we went to use this probe in the Mesoamerican species, this probe hybridized in autosomes, no involvement in the sex chromosome system. In this case, in the two species, Albata pigra and Albata pagliata, the chromosome involved in the Y autosome translocation has a homology with human chromosome 7. That show us that the chromosomes involved in the sex chromosome systems are different in the South American and Mesoamerican species. That we can we propose that the uh, multiple sex chromosome system, the, their origin happened twice independently in the two lineage and South American and Mesoamerican. But until now, I was talking to you about how we study the somatic chromosomes. But you can also study primate meiosis. You can study male meiosis, and uh, we work with testicular biopsies, again, taken under anesthesia by the veterinarians, and we study their meiotic chromosomes with a technique called immunofluorescence. With this technique, you use antibodies against the proteins of the cinetonemal complex. You can study early prophase, you can study the process of synapses and recombination by uh, using antibodies against proteins of the lateral and central elements. You can study the sexual system, you can study the uh, recombination rate or the crossing over process, but using antibodies against proteins in the recombination nodules. It gives you a lot of information, a lot of new information. In this slide, I show you a collaboration that we did with uh, Dr. Vanessa Foster from the uh, Universidad Federal de Santa Maria in Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, and Dr. Maria Susana Merani and Dr. Uh, Luis Rossi from the uh, University of Buenos Aires, where we study the uh, meiotic cycle in two howlers, Albata Caracha and Albata Guadilla. We use two antibodies. Uh, one is an antibody against SMC3 that libels the lateral elements of the synaptonema complex. So you can study pairing and, uh, pairing and synapses and crest that libels the centromer. You can see here how we are studying the uh, meiotic cycle and pairing. Here we see an autosome ambivalent, uh, ambivalent that's just about to finish pairing. You can see the two centromers and how it slowly finishing its synapses, the pairing and synapses. You can also study the sexual system. Here we see this species, Albata caracha, as I showed you before, has a sex chromosome system in male formed by four chromosomes. Therefore, it forms a quadrivalent in meiosis and a structure formed by the synapses of four chromosomes, one centromere, two centromere, three centromere, four centromere, a quadrivalent. Albata guariba clamita, however, has a sex chromosome system formed by five chromosomes. Here we can see the pentavalent it forms in meiosis, one, two, three, four, five centromere, and therefore we can study the progression and how these sexual systems behave during meiosis. But you can also study the recombination process, the crossing over process. You use an antibody against a protein called MLH1. See, this process indicates the sites called POSI where crossing over has occurred. These studies are very scarce in primates. 
uh, consult and collaborator study Macaca Mulata and uh, in a collaboration with Dr. Uh, Montserrat Garcia Caldez from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. We studied three species of neotropical primates, Cebus caris, Cebus nigritus, and Aluata caralla. Uh, in blue, the centromers are labeled. In red, the protein SYCP3, who is again, is uh, labeling the lateral elements of the uh, synaptonemic complex, and in green, MLH1. You can count this POSI for MLH1 and then calculate the recombination rate for each species. The recombination rate in all these non human primates was very similar, and all of these frequencies, doubled up this recombination rate, were all statistically lower than the recombination rate we observed in humans. That's 49.8. Uh, 4.3 fossil per cell. Why? Well, we analyzed several factors that might explain these differences. One, chromosomal morphology. In vertebrae, there is a correlation between the fundamental number or number of chromosomes arms. I mean, metacentrics and submetacentrics have two chromosome arms. And after sentence, they count only one chromosome n. So, the higher the fundamental number, the higher the number of chromosome arms, the higher the recombination rate. Here, I show you the uh, chromosome numbers and sex determination system of these four species. And you can see that in the platurini, the fundamental number are very similar, and but they are lower to macaca mulata. And yet, the recombination rate is similar, it's very similar. And all these fundamental numbers are lower than the one we found in Homo sapiens. But then, the, the, the sites where coursing over occur are not random. They occur in specific sites called recombination hotspots. And the location and number of these hotspots is related to the allelic variant of a gene called PRDM9. This gene encodes for a histone methyltransferase, who has a DNA binding domain that is, is called zinc finger tandem module. The allelic variation mainly occurs on sites that call for the number of these motifs, and, and thus modulating the specificity and affinity of DNA binding. In Macaca mulata, this gene was studied and they found nine times the same thing in mother motifs. In humans, they found a higher viability from nine to 15 times the same thing in motifs. And now uh, we are currently sequencing this gene, trying to answer this question to see what's happening with this uh, recombination hotspots if they are related to the uh, allelic variation of the gene. So perhaps next conference I can show you the results on this line of research. Of research. And the last line of research I wanted to show you is a collaboration we're doing with Dr. Maria Jose Bresta from the University of Buenos Aires, where we're studying the genome nucleotide composition. We are studying the uh, composition on, of AT base pairs and G3 base pairs in Hauler genomes using a technique called sequential fluorescent bands, where we use two fluorochromes, DAPI, who has an affinity for AT base pairs, and chromomycin A3, who has an affinity for G3 base pairs. Here we see a DAPI stain. A metaphyte of the black and gold howler monkey, and here we see a, a chromomycin A3 metaphyse band. You can see the pattern of light and dark bands that this type of uh, staining produces. We perform this technique in three howler monkey species: Aluata caracha, Aluata pigra, and Aluata guariba caramitans. 
and here we, you can see how we analyze this uh, information. We label all the uh, la, uh, all the bright bands that we obtain in each planning technique, and then compare. We did interspecific comparison between key holders and humans. Here's an example of what we found. We found that uh, I told you before that the homology of the region of sequence similarities between uh, non-human primates and Homo sapiens are known. So we know that these three chromosomes, chromosome 14 of Aluata Karasha, chromosome 6 of Aluata Wariba Clamitan, and uh, chromosome 17 of Albata Pigra, uh, are, they have all sequence similarity with chromosome 7 of Homo sapiens. But what we found is that the pre-Centromerican terminal a, a GC base pair rich in howler monkeys correspond to those observed in the regions of Homo sapiens. Although the site was larger, there was an amplification of this type of sequences. And once uh, one band, one interstitial band in Homo sapiens was not conserved in this howler. We also found a differential distribution of these. Uh, GC base pairs regions and AT base pair regions in the three holders. In Alberta Karasha, we found a higher proportion of interstitial A3 and rich regions, while in Alberta Guariba Camita and Alberta Pigra, we find a higher proportion of pericentromeric GC and rich regions and terminal GC and rich regions. We also found and we also know the homologies, the chromosomal homologies for all of those three, uh, all those three holders. But we found that the homology for nuclear content in GZ base pairs were full, were total only in six chromosome pairs of these three species. The difference observed in the pattern of fluorescent bands could be due to the chromosomal rearrangements that occurred during the evolution of these whole species and a subsequent diversification in their nucleotide composition. When we compare with Homo sapiens, we noticed that the GZ and rich regions were mostly correlated to regions in the human genome that were characterized to have a really high GZ content, higher than 53%. The chromosomal rearrangement would have occurred that modified the location of these regions in the whole monkeys, as well as possible amplification and loss of these regions. We are still studying, we are um, um, studying new species with this methodology. Uh, maybe next year I can show you more results. Uh, well, these were some of the lines of research we do in our research group. Uh, my email is the first slide of this presentation. Should you want to contact me? Thank you very much for your attention. That was fabulous. Thank you very much, Dr. Stein. I thought it was understood correctly. I'm not an English native speaker, so it was challenging. You did great. It was it was wonderful. Um, and yes, with yes. that being said, we've we've got plenty of time for questions. You can either raise your hand and Ashton and I will try to figure out how to unmute you, or you can post them in the chat and I will reiterate them myself. I heard something. Is someone raising their hand? Yep. Okay. Let's see. Clayton, you should be unmuted now. All right. Hello. Were you able Hello. to backtrack the DNA to be able to figure out when platyrines would have first evolved in South America from your DNA studies from their transit from Africa to South America? Uh, could you repeat? Um, I when you were oh, when you were studying the DNA, were you able to figure out when platyrines would have diverged from catarines? Well, uh, not from my studies. There are several studies of uh, molecular genetics using 
a nuclear and mitochondrial genes that have a study exactly the, the day where this might have occurred. Uh, evolution is an historical science. We propose hypotheses. We don't have a time machine to prove it, but uh, not from my research, but from other uh, researchers, there are a few dates already proposed. Thank you so much. Love the lemur. Thank you. Can I ask a question as a moderator? Of course. Um, so I, my study species for my master's thesis is also Alawada Karaya. And one thing I'm asked a lot is like, well, why study howler monkeys to answer questions about humans? And so I would like to pose that to you and hear your take. Well, uh, I'm partial to howler monkeys. They are my favorite model. I love studying sex chromosomes, and they are a remarkable model because they have these uh, multiple sex chromosome systems. Uh, primates are an excellent model to study, uh, non-human primates are an excellent model to study human evolution. Uh, I use uh, human probes to study the chromosomal evolution of the genus. And um, I don't know, Ose, I mean, we tend to uh, focus a lot on human evolution and human issues, but I think you got to study it from the pri non human primate perspective as well. Uh, especially now where their habitat is threatened by us, mainly. We are the menace. So I don't know. I, I love studying uh, non-human primates. I'm lucky enough to be able to do it and to get paid to do it. So I'm happy. <laughs> and I hope you be, will be really happy studying cobbler monkeys and I love the Karasha. <laughs> you also, you, you mentioned right as you were answering that, that you, you like studying howler monkeys and you also really love studying sex chromosomes. What interested you? Like what got you interested in the genetics of this? Oh, did we lose her? Uh, well, uh, it was very early in my career when I read a paper by an Australian researcher called Jennifer Marshall Wright. She studied a, a she studied very interesting models such as uh, monotremes and marsupials, uh, who has very interesting sex chromosome systems. Again, monotremes have a a multiple sex chromosome system for about nine chromosomes and, uh, and 10 chromosomes in other cases. So that was very interesting. And plus she entitled her paper, uh, Sex Chromosome Evolution, A Feminist View. So I just loved it. <laughs> I just loved it. And when I started to study the different uh, characteristics of the uh, genomes and how the Y chromosome in non-human primates is different, it's rearranged. I hope that by the end of my career, I can answer a little bit of the question of how it's different. If there is a reason, there might be none, there might be none, I might never answer that question of why it's different, how? Why do we see so many multiple sex chromosome systems in platyrrhini and not in cataract. I don't know. I hope I can understand it and I can learn about it someday. No idea. We see. I have many years, hopefully, ahead of me. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? DNA, monkeys? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like gonna dominate the questions because I'm interested in this too. But I'm wondering if your work with, with these monkeys has been impacted at all by COVID-19 because I imagine you're working in very close proximity with these animals and 
um, when we see these really on stream. Everyone, everyone is at home. I haven't been to the lab since uh, March 16, 2020. So I really miss my lab. I really, really do. I miss the people I work with to see them in person. But uh, we, uh, right now, as a primatologist community, we are staring as far away as we can from the monkeys because they are susceptible to the, to the virus. I, we don't want to get, uh, we don't want to bring the virus to them, to the natural uh, habitats of them. We are doing enough with all the wildfire, while killing their environment, that's enough. So yes, this is going to have a huge impact on everyone. There's gonna be a, a while, a, a large time yet to come until we can go back to the forest, I think until we can go back to the captive enclosures and work with the monkeys. It's gonna be a while. Uh, it's, it's a global pandemic. There's nothing I can do. Well, Clayton, you should be good for question number two. Question All number right. Two. Just to go back to what you were saying earlier about them having more sex chromosomes, I wonder if that could be a part of them being stuck in South America after rafting over, if that's a part of genetic drift and bottlenecking that their genetics had a somewhat of an endism and that that created more uh, sex chromosomes. I wonder if you could speak to that. I, I would. Well, the spreading of the sex chromosome, the origin of this sex chromosome system yes. may have occurred uh, by this process, uh, may have occurred uh, by a bottleneck, may have occurred in uh, small populations and then it spread. Uh, but we don't know just yet. Uh, there is a very interesting question in the chat by TF. She asked if the, or she, I don't know, it is known whether the consequence of having a multiple sex chromosome system, what is being changed in the expression of this species in comparison to simple sex chromosome systems. And that has to do with the question to ask Clayton. We don't know. Uh, this, uh, these systems may have a rise in really small population and then spread. There are other neotropical primate species, more genius in that the ones that have multiple sex chromosomes that have XY, XX sex chromosome system. That's the more spread, the most frequently observed in neotropical primates. But there are several genus that have this type of sex chromosome system. One thing I know that these primates, the ones that have multiple sex chromosome systems, have a regular meiosis. They have no problem whatsoever in their fertility. If something like this happens on a human, it's a pathology. Human, uh, we have a, a lot of flex, uh, flexibility in our genome to this type of changes. These monkeys do not. And you have several groups such as Loata Guariba clamitans, where they say that this is a, a species complex. Along the distribution of the genus, you have XY chromosome, a six, a five chromosomes in the sex chromosome system, three chromosomes in the sex chromosome system. You have a variability that is amazing in this group along the Atlantic forest. If this, uh, we don't know what change in the spectrum in this species with the expression of the genes in comparison with the sex chromosome system. We're still studying. We still don't know the uh, actual place where the uh, breaks occur. We don't know which are the sequences that are in Y1, which are, the, which are the sequences that are in Y2. We don't know yet. We are trying to study this amazing model to keep studying. 
Well, another question. They are sending me privately in the chat the question. That's okay. Yeah, that's that's it. That's a bit, that's allowed. <laughs> From Dr. Eleanor Fett. She's a five biologist, but she thinks that a low attack could be interesting because of his large geographical distribution of neotropical primates. That's true. Uh, Aluata genus covered from Mexico to northern Argentina. It's a really good model to study. You can and I, I didn't mention it in the in the lecture, but there is another characteristic of the chromosome of this species. In some species such Aluata, sorry, such Aluata sara and Aluata semicolon, you have what is called accessory chromosomes. The chromosomes, the only primate who has these types of chromosomes. Uh, there are very few cytogenetic studies because, well, it's harder to combine, to get the samples. I mean, it's an invasive sample. Uh, even more, if you want to study meiosis by particular biopsy, it's really hard uh, and you need to do it safely. We want to know more about the primate. We don't want to cause them any harm. So it's really hard to combine. Uh, so there are very few studies, but yes, uh, there are amazing studies to, get, to keep working uh, more and more every day. Anybody else? You can either raise your hand, you can chat me, or you can chat Dr. Steinberg personally. Okay. Anybody else got questions or comments? Or I guess, Dr. Steinberg, is there anything else that you would like to share with us specifically? No, I mean, you have my mail, the first slide of the presentation. You can contact me whenever you like, and we can still discuss things through, uh, through the email. There is no problem with that. Cool. Well, then I guess we can wrap up this session. Our next one is at 1030 with primarily primates. Um, great job, Dr. Steinberg. This is such interesting research and it's so vital and important in these species because they're so important to those ecosystems in South America. So thank you very much for being here and for sharing your work with us. We can't wait to see what you come up with for the next conference and hopefully by then we could have all been in the field. So thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you.